Today, I want to talk about math. I know, but hang in there. I've only got seven minutes, and I'll try and make this as interesting as possible. I mean, I hope you learned something by the end, but if you don't, at least enjoy this fun story about a visit to the doctor's office. <laughs> I want to start off by telling you this story. Imagine this. You wake up, and as you start to go about your day, something's feeling, well, not quite right. But you brush that feeling off, you go to school, and the feeling gets worse. So after school, you run to the doctor, and the doctor doesn't really know what's going on. They run a battery of tests, and they say they'll get back to you in a few days. A few days later, you're feeling fine, and then you get this call. Turns out, it's bad news. You tested positive for this hypothetical horrible disease, let's call it disease A, and you're frightened. You could grow a third year or something. The doctor says the test has a 98% accuracy, but as you start to panic, they remind you to take a deep breath. Let's wait a month and see if it progresses. I mean, false positives are totally a thing. You'd think that it would be rare, but occasionally, perfectly healthy people accidentally test positive. And so, a month later, you're fine. Turns out you never had it at all. And so you start to wonder to yourself, well, what went wrong? I mean, the test did have a 98% accuracy. And you start talking about this with your really smart math friend. And then Robert's like, oh yeah, that makes perfect sense. It's Bayesian statistics. You stare at him with this confused look on your face. And this slide pops out of thin air. See, it's not that that 98% figure is inaccurate, but it's a little bit misleading. Because that 98% figure that we use to quantify the effectiveness of a test assumes that you have the disease in the first place. That is what we're interested in measuring, after all. But it's important to rem remember that this does not take into account false positives. So when you have a disease with a rather low prevalence, or a test with, let's say, middling accuracy, it's pretty easy to be miscategorized. In the picture to my left, the 49 red squares represent the 49 people that the test correctly identifies as having the disease. There are 10,000 people, and assuming the true prevalence of the disease is 0.5%, well then, 10,000 times 0 0.005 is 50 people, or the number of people who have the disease. Out of those 50 people, we know that 98%, or 49, are correctly identified as having the disease. Now, that one yellow square is the one person with the disease that the test fails to identify. But in the context of our story, we're really more concerned with the green squares, the people who were inaccurately identified as having the disease. We might call them false positives. We have to assume the test has what's called a 98% specificity level. That means that the test identifies 98% of the people who don't have the disease correctly. So out of the 9,950 remaining people, we know that 199, or 2%, will falsely be identified as testing positive. So from here, it's pretty simple to realize that the true chance of you having the disease, given your positive test, is simply 49 over 248. The number of people who have the disease and tested positive over the total number of people who tested positive for the disease. And I mean, that means that the real chance that your positive test was correct is really only about, well, 20%. So the important thing to keep in mind here is that you were randomly selected. The doctor just administered this battery of tests. In real life, even though this is, I mean, quite frankly, kind of scary, doctors can afford to use tests like these because they're very narrow and specifically focused, and the doctor has a reason to believe that you actually have that disease. So uh, while this can be summarized with the formula to my left, Bayesian, this really is just an application of mathematical common sense. What initially seems nonsensical or confusing is just a byproduct of the reality that we all live in when we examine it more closely. There's a different, almost poetic version of 
looking at this that everyone can understand. The chances of you arriving at any given place are the chances of you getting there given your starting point and the chances of ever being at that starting point at all. It's a different, almost hopeful or empowering way of looking at life. I mean, the chances of you being able to fulfill your dreams are a combination of your ability to fulfill your dreams and your ability to start yourself. But, well, why am I talking to you about this? Why is this important? And I mean, come on, first of all, this is just some cool math. I mean, this is the reason why Gmail spam filtering is so much better than Outlooks. But other than that, two reasons. First of all, this reminds us that nothing is ever certain. The values in that formula are always changing. And so that extra bit of effort might just be enough to push you over the edge. It means that nothing is certain, but that also means that nothing is impossible. And well, number two, always be careful about what you're told. We all like to quote numbers and it's easy to fall into the trap of believing that numbers are infallible. But quite frankly, it's pretty easy to manipulate numbers in a way that results in them being, well, meaningless. Information is meaningless without context and that's true without exception. I mean, it's, this is a problem endemic to the way we think and so it's our responsibility to make sure that numbers pass the smell test. Because if we aren't careful, I mean, half the time, it's not even necessary to intentionally obfuscate information, intentionally hide things. Because according to Bayes' theorem, as long as you don't look too carefully, it's pretty easy to find examples of what you're looking for. So, try and avoid catching any mystery diseases in the future. But if you think you have, don't worry. Math has got your back. Thank you.